um, you know, I have a lot of people in the group that have, have contributed to these, these topics over the years and, and listing them there. Um, okay, so as an outline, let me, I'll start by just inter you know, introducing the transport coefficients that I'm most concerned with. Uh, you know, in, in these nanoscale thermal transport problems, which are really this thermal conductivity and this idea of an interfacial thermal conductance. But then I'm going to take a step back and I wanted to, you know, I, I, you, know you saw in the title I have this word problem, right? What do, what do I mean by a problem? So there's maybe a little bit of almost scientific philosophy. So what, how do we pick our, our problems or, you know, what do, we, what do we, how do we organize our work? And I just wanted to, go, you know, talk about that a little bit. Um, and then I'm going to give you three, after I define what problems mean, I'm going to uh, talk about three what I consider problems in nanoscale thermal transport that I personally find, uh, you know, organizes my work, organizes my thinking. And these kind of bigger picture problems are things such as, you know, how low can the thermal conductivity of a material be? What are the limits to thermal conductivity? Both globally across all materials, but also specifically within certain classes of materials. And also the properties of interfaces. What's the, what's the lowest thermal conductance an interface can be? What's the highest thermal conductance an interface can be? Same thing here. So how high can thermal conductivity be? Turns out that's a little more constrained in crystals, but actually it's a very interesting problem in polymers. Where can the thermal conductivities be increased? Uh, and also in terms of interfacial properties. But then when you end up with thermal conductivity being very high, it turns out that there's, a, there's also a big picture problem of can you even make use of it at the nanoscale? Because if you have a small heat source that's comparable to the size of, say, the carrier mean free paths, then what, what happens in that situation? That's maybe not the biggest picture kind of problem. It starts to sort of get down into the weeds maybe of engineering of thinking about how to apply uh, high thermal conductivity materials and devices, but certainly an important problem. This is maybe another sort of little bit sideline, but you know, I'd say we know an awful lot about electrons. We know a lot about phonons. I would say we know very little about magnons and how they, what the limits might be to how uh, much heat magnons can carry in materials. And then. I'm not sure I'm going to have time to do this, but this actually gets into a kind of more thermal, you know, material science topics, which is where do we find physics or material science, if you will, that gives us more function in thermal properties other than just a static transport property. So something that responds to the environment, something that we can switch or use as a regulator. All right, so the thermal transport coefficients that I'm concerned about are the thermal conductivity. I'm going to write this as a capital lambda. That's the linear transport coefficient that relates a, a gradient in temperature to a heat current, something you probably learned in freshman physics classes. We can write it in terms of fluctuations. This is just the fluctuation dissipation theorem written for heat condu conduction with fluctuations here, heat, heat uh, dissipation there. And the other transport property that I'm interested in is I'm going to write as a capital G, and that's the thermal conductance per unit area of an interface. That's a linear transport uh, coefficient that relates a temperature drop across the interface to the heat current that's propagating across that inter interface. Again, we can always write it in terms of fluctuations because we're talking about something that's near equilibrium, not far from equilibrium. It's a linear response. And so these relation kinds of relationships hold. Pardon? Uh, this Q? That Q is a heat, flu heat flux across the interface. This is a heat current in the bulk, so it has sort of different units. Uh, it's heat, right? It's, it's a heat current. And so these are the fluctuations. So something with a large thermal conductance of an interface, you know, has a very large amount of heat that's highly correlated, sloshing back and forth across the interface. That's what gives us a high, you know, and if we put on a temperature difference, it tilts it in a little bit and gives us a heat current. It's the usual, usual kinds of problems. All right, so what do we care about those transport coefficients? Well, if you're an engineer, you really care about them because they're the things that go into the solutions of the heat diffusion equation. Uh, this is the, you know, heat capacity, uh, the first derivative of, of the temperature with respect to time, thermal conductivity, two derivatives with respect to space for temperature. 
And that partial differential equation, of course, is the basis of how we sol solve for how heat diffuses in, in, uh, in a structure and it allows us to predict how, te how temperature evolves and how heat currents evolve in the material. These two parameters, you can also you know, write it as different combinations of two parameters you know, in different ways. Uh, thermal diffusivity is the ratio of those two parameters. That has the usual units, meter length squared per, per time. And then effusivity is the square root of the product of the, of the thermal conductivity and heat capacity. That's also a very important concept in all these kinds of problems. That's uh, essentially like a thermal impedance. It basically plays the same role as an acoustic impedance um, in, a, you know, in acoustic reflection or basically also an optical index refraction. It's, it's sort of the same, same thing, but it's for the thermal, thermal diffusive waves. And then finally, I'm going to, so this interfacial thermal conductance, how does that appear here? Well, at the first level of the, of the description, it's just a boundary condition. It's a radiative boundary condition, which means it's a coefficient times a temperature difference is equal to a heat current. And that's what this equation is saying. Okay, so just a radiative boundary condition on the diffusion equation. And then uh, we, we like to, you know, think about link scales, nanoscales. And I'm going to show you in a minute that this is actually at the nanoscale. This is called the Kapitza length in honor of Peter Kapitza, who I guess first talked about these kinds of things in the context of liquid helium in contact with copper. Um, you know, Kapitza was a Nobel Prize winner. I'm not sure, I'm not sure for what. I guess it was heat super for this for this problem. Okay. Um, and the ratio of those two things has a units of length. So we call it the Kapitza length, uh, you know, in, in that context. All right, so thermal conductivities. So thermal conductivities of dense materials, dense solids, spans a, a factor of 40,000. So the highest thermal conductivity material is diamond. It has a high thermal conductivity because it has phonons that have high velocity. They, they have high coherence, meaning they don't scatter much. And so it's a very, you know, the thermal conductivity is about 2,000. If we keep going down, there's this, this is a very interesting uh, result. I'll say a little bit more about later. That's a, a paper, uh, actually there are three papers in Science Magazine back to back, all reporting the thermal conductivity of that crystal. And I can tell you at dinner or something a story. Um, but this thermal conductivity is about 1,000 boron arsenide, just a zinc blend. Very recently discovered though, it wasn't really known before that it had such properties. And we go down to things like, you know, copper. Copper has a high thermal conductivity because the electronic density of states is relatively high, not that high, but somewhat high, and the mobility is large. And so they, the electrons carry heat effectively. Silicon, we know about. Uh, xylon is another interesting um, data point. That's a, actually, xylon is a liquid crystal polymer fiber. So it's a highly high modulus fiber. It's developed for its mechanical properties. And it's not a crystal, really. It's, it's a very rigid rod molecule. And this is the highest thermal conductivity organic material that we've seen in our laboratory. Other people have reported higher things, but I'm not so sure. We haven't been able to reproduce them. So uh, we, we think this is a reliable result. And then you go down into amorphous materials. Glass is kind of convenient. Glass has its unit. In MKS units of watt per meter Kelvin, glass has a thermal conductivity of about one, window glass anyway, right? So if you can kind of keep it calibrated in your head, everything's kind of relative to glass if you, if you like. Uh, go down to polymers, that's about 0.2. And then there's these, these materials that we've studied in my group. In fact, I think this, this was, you know, we discovered or, you know, revealed this, that these materials have thermal conductivity of about 0.05 watt per material, uh, watt per meter Kelvin. That's the lowest thermal conductivity dense solids we know of. And those are relatively recently developed, you know, recent uh, realizations. That's about twice the thermal conductivity of air in a solid. It's about the same as the thermal conductivity of a styrofoam coffee cup. But, you know, the walls that's been foamed, but, but it's a dense, a dense material. Well, that's yeah, porous materials can be lower. Uh, aerogels can be kind of down around there. Um, 
actually state of, but, but okay, I was making the dense. So I would say like no fair making it porous. I mean, if I take the material away, then there's nothing there, right? I mean, you can do that arbitrarily. Um, but actually, the, it's, a, it's a also a wonderful problem, big, big picture problem, is you know, a foamed polyurethane or polystyrene foam insulation that's used in building materials or you know, refrigerators and on and on and on has a thermal conductivity at best of about 0.02, no, a little bit lower, maybe a little bit less than air, 0 0.02, 0 0.018, something. Um, you know, and those are, you know, the whole world is insulated by this material. <laughs> and, you know, imagine the improvement, you know, the, what you could do to carbon footprint if you could make a better one, right? And it has all to do, I mean, it's a complicated problem. There's radiation, there's conduction by the gases, there's conduction by the matrix. Um, but, you know, that's a big industrial problem. Interface conductance spans about a factor of 100, so a much you know, smaller range. And that's actually understandable because it's a, I don't know, because it's basically just a, a heat flux kind of problem rather than a coherence problem. Uh, the highest thermal con conductance interface we've ever uh, studied, which I think is the record, is a little exotic. It's aluminum on MGO at 60 gigapascal inside of a diamond anvil cell. So 60 gigapascal is about the pressure halfway to the core of the, you know, to the core of the earth or something, you know, in the mantle. So this is a, you know, kind of an extreme condition, uh, but it gives, gives you a very high conductance. These are ambient condition, titanium nitride on MGO also, MGO also has a very high thermal conductance. You can see it has units here, megawatts per square meter per Kelvin and approaches numbers of gigawatts per square meter per Kelvin. So I could put a output power of a nuclear power plant through a m meter square of area of an interface of this type, it produces one, t one degree temperature drop. Right. Th so it's a, it's a kind of a nano, this is what I mean by kind of a nanoscale phenomena. If we go down, you can go down various materials. This is actually Humphrey Maris's work from you know, quite a long time ago. Um, we re kind of repeated this. We think maybe there's some problems with the pump probe measurements at that time. This is the lowest thermal conductance interface we've studied, which is bismuth on hydrogen terminated diamonds. So you take the kind of big squishy atoms and you stick it on the stiffest, smallest atoms and also make the interact interfacial interactions as weak as you can. And the thermal conductance comes out about 10 in these units. But even that small number is a lot larger than what you would predict based on a simple model of a vibration in one material communicating with a vibration in another material elastically. And the reason for this higher conductivity, I guess you a second, uh, is presumably due to nonlinear phenomena, but it's never really been sorted out exactly quantitatively how this works. Yeah. Yeah, I get that in a second. So equivalent film thickness is essentially the Kapitza length referenced, you have to reference it to something. So this is just reference to the window glass, so to the one watt per meter Kelvin. So what that means is that one of these interfaces has the same thermal resistance as one nanometer of glass. This interface has a thermal resistance of about 100 nanometers of glass. Actually, I know that there's a preprint that has something a little lower than this. It has to do with 2D, like graphene on 2D materials or something. And it's a little bit, it's kind of more down in this, this range. It's a little lower. So this is maybe no longer the record. But, but this is the kind of thing uh, the community is pushing. And I just put on the side here, there's some other work we've done in our group. Things like, you know, you can also talk about this. This is an interface between, say, a solid and a liquid. That's what Kapitza studied. But it was between copper and a quantum liquid or a you know, liquid helium. Um, you know, if, you, if you're at room temperature and you're interested in how something con transfers energy to, say, water, then it turns out that they, we can distinguish between hydrophilic and hydrophobic interfaces, and they make a, you know, a difference on the factor of sort of two to three level. Or you can go down to things that are very weakly bounded. This is actually from Eric Popp's group. There's the, the value is about molybdenum disulfide on silicon dioxide is also about 10. Or we did this study quite a long time ago of nanotubes surrounded by alkane or by organic materials. And the thermal conductance, again, is quite small, which makes it difficult, say, to use um, nanotubes to improve the thermal conductivity, say, of a polymer through composites or 
you know, management of thermal management of two-dimensional devices. And then I'll just finish up. So heat capacity per unit volume is boring. It only varies by a factor of four or so, um, you know, across everything. So the highest um, thermal ca uh, heat capacity of almost any, I think this is basically true, of anything is water. So you know why? Why, why is water's heat capacity so high? Yes, hydrogen bonds. So, okay, so everyone knows, right. So entropy, you know, so heat capacity, you know, is temperature rate of change of entropy. So normally we only, con normally we're only concerned with vibrational entropy. And the vibrational entropy is increasing with temperature, um, you know, as a log of temperature. So you take the derivative, you get one over temperature back times temperature gives a constant. That's the long to T, you know, classical heat capacity. But water has a very high heat capacity because the entropy of the hydrogen bonding is changing with temperature quite strongly near room temperature. And so you get a contribution of the heat capacity from that. So other excitations can contribute. That's also true of nickel. Nickel is, I mean, it goes up even more as you go toward the Curie temperature of pair magnetic tra phase transition. But even at room temperature, there's some significant contribution both from electronics, the heat density of states, as well as from magnetic entropy um, contributing. We go down the system, and actually, then things like diamond, it's kind of a, you know, th this is, uh, diamond is, you know, very quantum mechanical. So only one, th about one third of the classical value, but so there's kind of a, you know, com competing factors there that keeps this into this range. And about the lowest th heat capacity solids are these things like lead telluride, bismuth telluride. Um, it's basically materials that have very low atom density so that the classical heat capacity, there's a number of vibrator vibrational states per unit volume is small. So you might recognize that that's a, these kinds of materials are good thermoelectrics. That's not a coincidence really because you, for a good thermoelectric you want there to be sort of less heat in the vibrational states. You want the vibrational states to not carry much heat. So at least you want to start off with, say, a low number of the heat capacity. All right, so now my little, that's my introduction to transport coefficients. Let me give my little spiel on scientific thinking or philosophy. Um, you know, then, you know, and, and give you some context of how I'm thinking about these problems. So. You know, what are these important, what, what important questions should we be asking and trying to answer in thermal transport at the nanoscale? And in a bigger uh, picture, you know, we would, we'd say, okay, well, if we really want to influence the field, we want to bring sort of revolutionary change. And these are things that people have talked about, philosoph philosophers of science have talked about, such as very, you know, famous, most, maybe the two most famous people, Gallison and uh, Kuhn. And I'm just acknowledging this is kind of inspired by a talk by George Whitesides, who's a chemist at Harvard, very senior guy, um, extremely influential materials chemistry um, and technology uh, scientist uh, um, with a, yeah, an incredible um, influence on the field, both directly and through the people that he's trained. So Gallison really emphasized the idea that new techniques are, are critical. Well, this community is would probably buy into that. There's a lot of technique work going on uh, in this community at synchrotrons and ultra-fast lasers and terahertz and all the other things. So, um, you know, you know, could kind of use some other bigger examples too. Say, you know, you could, could, uh, could I think, can reasonably argue that STM and atomic force micro microscopy kind of nucleated nanoscience back in the day. The STM was invented. The AFM was invented you know, about the time sort of brought uh, nanoscience. You know, PCR, um, chain you know, polymerase cha chain reaction really made molecular genetics possible, you know, the amplification of, of genetic material. You know, NMR in terms of spectroscopic NMR really revolutionized organic synthesis. You know, really knew what you were making and what, you know, how things were arranged. And I would say in the thermal field, maybe, okay, we don't have things like that, but we've done pretty well. So we have TDTR. I'll talk about that a lot more tomorrow uh, morning. Um, microfabricated platforms are another 
way that has advanced the field of heat transport at the nanoscale. You can ride nano wires and things on these small devices and probe the heat conduction uh, in them. Or things like scanning probes that have thermometers built into them. I think probably the IBM group is really currently has been, has been pushing that and leading that kind of area, the IBM Zurich group. Um, and, you know, all of these things have really, you know, advanced what we can do, the kinds of problems or questions we can ask about heat transport at the nanoscale. But, okay, to continue that thought, then we'd say, well, if we want to work toward, uh, you know, tools, we want to, our work is a lot focused on tools. Um, in terms of heat transport at the nanoscale, where should we look? What do we need? Um, well, we can talk about things like better time, space, excitation, energy, momentum resolution. And I think that's a lot of what mo you know motivates, uh, say, you know, time dissolved diffuse scattering or phonons or, or other kind you know things that have excitations to get that kind of information. And I would say you know, all these things are very important. But um, you know, what the question then becomes maybe exactly you know, what theory or model do we want to probe or test? What is it that we don't know that we want to be able to know? <laughs> Or what is it that we can't measure or can't calculate, and what experiment would we do? We need to do that. Um, and I'd say you know some of this comes back to this you know this idea of well fishing or looking. You know we call this like fishing expeditions or uh, you know looking for interesting things to happen. Create new tools. Look for things that are interesting to happen that are surprising, and then that advances the field. But certainly we need to, you know, to be able to fish in productive places so where we're likely to find, you know, new phenomena or things that are not currently addressed. All right. So the other way we could think about, you know, was revolutions was emphasized by Kuhn. And that really was more of a, you know, sort of dramatic step forward, step forward that comes from a paradigm shift. So a completely different way of thinking about it. And one of the great things I like about working on thermal sciences is actually we have a track record of that. And thermal sciences really led to the quantum led to quantum mechanics. You know, the the ultraviolet catastrophe, which was the fact that black body radiation just doesn't blow up to infinity, uh, you know, because of the you know classical occupation of the electromagnetic modes, and the fact that the heat capacity of solids such as diamond are much smaller than their classical value led to quantum mechanics. So Planck and then, you know, Einstein heat capacity. It's complete, you know, thermal, thermal phenomena. And I would say in our, you know, in our field, this nanothermal field, well, you know, what have we, you know, big conventional wisdoms have we overturned or changed? And I'd say, well, there's been things that have appeared, but then maybe questions. So, you know, things like, Silicon nano wires that were rough were thought to have some incredibly low thermal conductivity that had some physics that came out and you know some new physics. Well, it turns out this probably isn't true. It probably is caused by damage, something much more boring. Um, uh, you know, and things like high thermal conductivity of liquid suspensions, these were called nano fluids. And you can imagine in the engineering world, this is huge. You know, if you can make a better heat transfer fluid by adding some magical pixie dust to oil or water or ethylene glycol and make it a better heat transfer fluid, that's super important, exciting. And it turns out, well, there were reports of these big enhancements. It turns out it's almost certainly all wrong. It's, you know, some, some combination of aggregation, which is in some sense kind of real, uh, but also a lot of bad measurements, just a lot of bad um, uh, you kind of wishful thinking and bad experiments um, were, were at the um, kind of advanced. Um, so there's this, this other kind of, of so if you aren't if you don't have that you know or the steps toward that you know would be sometimes are in Kuhn would be called normal science and sometimes people would say oh, that's those are puzzles that we're solving so it's in terms of problems think of problems as kind of a bigger, open, more open-ended question, where a puzzle is maybe more of a specific thing that we're, we're after, maybe motivated by a theory. Um, and it, absolutely, this is mostly what we do. This is how we do, you know, we, we, 
we would develop our, our fields, uh, develop further an existing paradigm. Well, George Whitesides is you know, a little more critical about this. Um, he says these, this kind of work is, well, you, the, the answer's already known, really. The answer's not important. The interest lies largely in the elegance of the solution. Um, so that's the kind of critical view of this type of work, you know, that, um, that you know, okay, you're not, maybe you're not actually, you know, that this is basically, you know, that you're, do, you're doing something because it's sort of elegant. It's the next thing to do in the, in the communication. Um, but it's essential, right, um, that, you know, you need these, this, this progress of science through the solving of puzzles in order to get to the point where you can occasionally lead to a, a resolution. And then the, the bigger picture, more open-ended category of, of things would be problems. So um, larger scale questions where the strategy, maybe we don't know, maybe we don't even know that there's a solution. Um, you know, more bigger questions. Um, you know, and for me, this is what I wanted to talk about today, things like this. How close can we approach the perfect thermal insulator? Where would we find such physics? Um, you know, what are the upper or lower limits to the thermal conductivity of polymers? We know a lot about crystals. They're periodic. We can do all kinds of wonderful things with Locke's theorem. But if I have a disordered material, a polymer, um, you know, other kinds of, of bonding, other structure, how do we understand those things and, and make the, the field go forward? Or what kind of physics and materials can provide a high contrast switch for heat? or a regulator so that responds to temperature. All right, so I'll even assign a kind of, well, optional homework problem for the students if you want to, completely your interest. Um, but, you know, I'm interested in these kinds of things too and helping people think about them. Um, you know, solving puzzles is critical. So if you're working on a puzzle, how is your puzzle holding back the field and how is the solution to your puzzle going to allow the field to advance? Or maybe, Another or another possible assignment, kind of a different assignment, would be given the context of your experience and interests, and you're freed from constraints of money and existing techniques. Okay, I say the proverbial lab filled with nothing but money. What would you choose as a problem? Right? And why is that problem important? This is actually the kind of question we occasionally ask faculty candidates. You know, what would, you know, you get, we get, I get a little tired with the faculty candidates coming in and saying, oh, I'm going to write this proposal to this agency and they'll, they'll fund it. I'm pretty sure this will get funded. I go like, I don't really care. Tell me what you want to do. <laughs> What's your vision for the field? We can always back off from that and think about practical issues of how much funding you can get. But tell me what you really want to do. Okay, and I'm suggesting, you know, structure your answer as an elevator speech, so, so kind of a minute or 150 words. Does that term translate to French and German and other language, ele elevator speech? So the idea is you, 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 I don't know, in this context it would be something like you, you know, there's a program officer from the Department of Energy and you're at a meeting, in, in a March meeting or something, and you happen to be going back to your hotel and you get in the elevator with that program officer and they say, oh, what do you find, you know, what are you working on? <laughs> and you've got the time between there and the 10th floor of the building to explain it. That's an elevator speech. It's usually given more in the context of like, a, like an entrepreneur and a venture capitalist. So an entrepreneur goes up the elevator with the venture capitalist and has to give their pitch in one minute about their, their work. But you can also think about this on your own, okay? Anyway, just, just Okay, so here's my first problem. Um, my first problem is, you know, can I beat the uh, lower limit or the amorph what, we, what we call now the amorphous limit or the minimum thermal conductivity of materials? So I, I have to give you a little context. What is that conventional wisdom? Well, the conventional wisdom about this starts out with Einstein in 1911. You may or may not know that Einstein was the very first person to write down a theory for the heat conduction in a material. You don't know that because the, his theory is wrong. And Debye gave you the right answer the year later in 1912, I believe. Um, wrong for crystals, but maybe correct sort of for amorphous materials. And then there's a long, kind of a long history 
Um, you know, oh, not 1912, 1914. Um, but this, the original sort of picture does work um, pretty well. Um, Birch and Clark were geologists. Um, this is uh, Charles Cattell, who you, whose name you probably know from his textbook, um, Berkeley theorist. Uh, you know, and we extended it to different ways. You know, Glenn Slack, another you know big name. And the basic li bottom line is this, if you're in the high temperature limit, this prediction is that the thermal conductivity of, or the amorphous limit or the minimum thermal conductivity is a numerical factor times K Boltzmann, n to the two-thirds, that's the atomic density to the two-thirds power, and something like an average of the sound velocities, longitudinal and transverse sound velocities. Now you might say this is actually, I mean you can kind of derive this equation, but you might also just sort of think of it as dimensional analysis in a way. Uh, if I need to construct a thermal conductivity watt per meter Kelvin, and all I'm going to give you is the number of atoms per unit volume of the solid and the sound velocities in the solid, this is what you would have to do. <laughs> you know, and K Boltzmann always has to be there. There's heat, right? It's K Boltzmann has to be in the equation uh, if there's a, um, if we're involving heat. All right, now, okay, so this is Einstein's paper, so, um, from 1911. This is the one that I said is, you know, kind of right for amorphous materials, or at least we think of it as that way, but not correct for um, crystals. And what Einstein did is he, you know, okay, so his first, uh, you, you, like students, you should never do this. Never cite your own work as the first citation in a paper. So, but Einstein gets a pass. So, in my earlier work, this is the Einstein heat capacity paper of 1907. And so what Einstein did is he took his heat capacity Einstein oscillators and he coupled them together with springs and then calculated how much heat would flow. And you can see actually that he knew he was in trouble. He couldn't get anywhere close to enough heat conduction. So he coupled all of his oscillators to 26 neighbors. And then he did this comp you know, somewhat complicated classical mechanics. I mean, of course, he was very you know, good at that. And the, the critical assumption is, is that the vibrational states of these Einstein oscillators are random. They aren't correlated in any way. And of course, that's not correct. We know that there are normal modes, which are phonons, which are wave-like, which carry heat coherently, I guess, you know, over long distances. So actually, you know, also, this is a nice thing to keep in mind too. The next time you think something obvious, you missed something obvious in your work, think about poor Einstein. You would think he should have known that there were normal modes, I guess. I, I, don't, I don't know, sort of how did he miss that? And if he wouldn't, wouldn't have missed that, we wouldn't be talking about, you know, I guess to buy thermal conductivity, we'd be talking about Einstein thermal. And it works very well. So if you just take this, you know, measurements of the thermal conductivity of a lot of a bulk disordered and amorphous materials, do that very, very simple calculation, and this is the straight line of perfect agreement, you can see everything is kind of, you know, clustered along that line, not so bad for something that doesn't have very many, doesn't have any free parameters. It's just, you know, heat, just numbers of atoms and, um, uh, you know, sound velocities. And I have two, two different qu categories of materials here. One are pure real amorphous materials like glasses, uh, you know, disor oxide glasses, disordered crystals such as, say, things like, what do I got here, feldspar, which is a mineral that dominates the Earth's crust. Somewhere in here is stabilizer conia, which is the coating on turbine engine blades that keeps them from melting <laughs> and at the temperature of the combustion turbine engine. Um, so these are, you know, a lot of important important physics. This is kind of an exotic boride material, but you can see that this works works pretty well. So we were quite surprised, this was back in about 10 years ago, um, to find a material that really beat this by a lot. And there have been a lot of different attempts along the way, a little lots of places where we found thermal conductivities that were somewhat smaller by increasing increasing numbers of interfaces and in, in, in stacking things. And we could do, you know, factors of so, uh, a couple below that minimum value. But this is really the first time we get a material that has a very much lower thermal conductivity. 
So let me tell you about this material. So this material is tungsten diselenide, which has become very popular nowadays uh, with the rise of 2D material, but actually this was a little earlier than that. And this is, this is made by an unusual method where the atoms are, quent are essentially deposited at room temperature in the right quantities and in the right order. So this is done by David Johnson's group at University of Oregon. He's a, he's a materials chemist, so he's thinking it's basically you know, solid state chemistry. So we're putting down atoms of selenium, atoms of tungsten. Then you anneal it, and it forms layered dichalcogenide material. But it doesn't form a single crystal. This is drawn that makes it look like a crystal, but I'll show you in a second. It's not, it's not really that. Uh, it's, it, but and if you do measurements, you can get all the, you know, you can get all the, all the structures, uh, parameters out of all this. And, okay, so let me, let me say a little bit more, because I, I said I don't have a microscope image. Oh, I do have a little later, so maybe I'll use that in a second. Um, and this was what we found, that the thermal conductivity of these materials was down here, about you know, 0.05 as low as that, 0.06 watt per meter Kelvin, where this is the what you would calculate for the minimum thermal conductivity based on the sp measured speed of sound normal to the surface, to the layering direction. So we took into account the, the very you know, somewhat low speeds of sound across the layering direction. Although I'll show you in a minute, we didn't take into account the softening of the transverse waves. And we get about a factor of six below this amorphous limit. So the conventional limit is beaten by about a factor of six. And another nice test here is that if you take these materials and you ion ra irradiate them, so you irradiate them with uh, heavy ions in order to damage them to basically mix up the atoms, then the thermal conductivity goes back up. So you basically can get rid of these interfacial phenomena or this stacking phenomena and you can get that. Yeah, so what, but I'll just kind of bring you up to date on this is that we didn't realize at that time, or we didn't really think about it carefully, that if this material that I've, that I've created, that, we, that we've created, would also have a very soft shear modulus. So think about this material as, we have these, these two-dimensional crystalline sheets which are formed by this annealing of this deposited atoms. Think of it as like, okay, what happens is, it, it, think of it as like if I threw a deck of playing cards on a table and I pushed them all back together, I would have a random orientation of these playing cards with relative to each other. If I push it all together and make a deck, that would be a crystal. But if I leave them as just a random blob, you know, of sheets, that's what this material is more like. We call that sometimes turbostratic, or you can just think of it as a, a rotationally disordered structure. And if you have these 2D materials that are rotationally disordered, and you think about how they, what potential they see for the motion between these sheets, then if they're rotated in a disordered way, then this restore, they don't really nest. They don't have a restoring force or a very big one. Or that was what we thought we should try to study. And, we, and it turns out it's true. This is actually turned out to be a very difficult experiment and I probably uh, doing surf using surface acoustic waves. But this is an example of a slightly different material. This is molybdenum diselenide, tin selenide, um, grown by the same way. This is stem data so we can see all the atoms and you can see the sort of correlation to how, how much they're correlated in this direction. And they, they stack up. And if we measure the shear modulus of this material in a method, I'll just like surface acoustic waves, so I'll just show you in a minute. The shear modulus is on the order, let's just say it's on the order of one. That's a very small shear modulus, right? So, you know, the shear modulus of a polymer is about the smallest of sort of typical materials. And that's around maybe two gigapascal or three. So it's a very, we call it ultra-low shear modulus in this, in this layered material. And so the transverse um, vibrational modes are strongly suppressed. All right, this is just, so I'm going to kind of back into a new topic by talking about the surface acoustic waves. So this is how we do, did this particular measurement of surface acoustic waves. And this community studies these kinds of things, I guess, quite frequently. This is our little bit of a little take on it. 
uh, which is to use a PDMS mass, so that's a polydimethyl siloxane, so silicone rubber mask, which is molded in a um, uh, silicon mold, which is commercially available, you just buy it. And it has a 700 nanometer period and 350 nanometer depth. You mold the silicon mass, the silicone rubber mask in that mold, take it out, and then just stick it on your sample. So it's like a kind of a nano grating tape. <laughs> stick it on the sample. And then we do a pump probe measurement, just like everyone does pump probe measurements for um, acoustics, using this PDMS mask in order to generate and detect surface acoustic waves in a sample, which has been coated with a, usually with a metal film. And this is an example of the surface acoustic waves. And we have quite sophisticated software now. My student did a, this guy, very brilliant guy, um, wrote this you know, nice MATLAB code. It's on GitHub. It gives the surface acoustic wave velocity for any number of layers that are stacked with like any symmetry of cubic, tetragonal, hexagonal in any orientation. <laughs> and so, you know, it's a little bit more extreme than we need, but um, you can calculate, you know, use fitting parameters to calculate elastic constants from the surface acoustic wave velocities from this kind of infrastructure. So it's kind of convenient. Uh, there are some experimental issues. If you have very soft materials, it turns out you need to make the metal layer quite thick. You need to have a sort of a reasonable thickness of material you want to study the elastic constants of, and typically we need a stiff substrate for the soft material in order to get good sensitivity, and this kind of just shows some of the details, but maybe it's not so important here. Uh, but we can kind of optimize the sensitivity to C44 by picking the thickness of the aluminum correctly and, and optimizing uh, this is sensitive density sensitivity modules um, that we were doing. So, you know, I, I gave you that example we were doing with the 2D materials, but now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, macro macromolecular solids. So, again, this is motivated partly by this idea of, well, we know a lot about inorganic materials. We know about a lot about crystals, about the phonons in those materials. Maybe not so much in disordered materials, but certainly in crystals. Uh, and if we start thinking about these different kinds of polymeric materials, we're, you know, we're exploring, we're studying this problem of how can I make their thermal conductivity lower? How can I make their thermal conductivity higher? Well, one idea to make their thermal conductivity higher is to somehow increase the bonding between the chains in the material. So we can kind of go through this very systematically, go from materials that are mostly van der Waals bonding between chains, polystyrene, uh, common things that you know about, probably heard about polystyrene and polymethyl methacrylate, lucite. Um, and as you add hydrogen bonding to the, to the materials, you get things like polyvinyl alcohols, acrylic acids, or you can even make what are sometimes called polymer salts, which are polymeric materials with, you know, say lithium, calcium, ions in them that makes the material stiffer, sometimes called ionomers or other you know, things. So, so ex expectation might be that this will, you know, influence the, the thermal conductivity. Well, we did, I mean, to, th to think about this whole problem, we want to know how stiff we made them. So we want to be able to understand their elastic constants. And so we use peak regular conventional picosecond acoustics to measure their uh, longitudinal modulus, C11, from the sound longitudinal sound velocity. And we use that surface acoustic wave technique that I just mentioned to measure the shear velocity, the C44. And then these are these materials. Okay? And you can see it goes as you might expect, polystyrene, up to this PVP calcium salt. And it spans, you know, basically all factor of 10, you know, all polymers. Okay, so we can, we can vary these quantities quite a bit. This is kind of a little bit of a curiosity. I, I, I'm curious. This is the Poisson ratio. So it's, these are isotropic materials. They have two parameters. I can also write it in terms of a Poisson ratio. So this is kind of redundant information. This line indicates a Poisson ratio of 0.37. This line indicates a Poisson ratio of 0.25. And it seems that the Poisson ratio changes <laughs> when you increase the dense, you know, bonding. Yeah. 
Yeah. So this is an important question. So the, the question is about sort of viscoelasticity. All of these measurements are done, I mean, the surface acoustic wave measurement is done at, say, 4 gigahertz. Uh, the picosecond acoustic measurement is done at, I don't know, you could think of that as sort of 20, 30 gigahertz. So these are extremely high frequencies for anybody who does polymer science. The, the polymer scientists call this the, I don't know, they call it like the, the infinite frequency limit or something. They know, um, you know, anything for polymer science, anything faster than kilohertz is the infinite frequency limit, usually. Uh, so these are, these are the high frequency limit. You don't have, there's no um, chain conformation in these materials. I mean, even if you study an elastomer, you're, well, that's not completely true, but even in, a, even in a silicone elastomer, you're above all the dynamics. Not by a lot, you know, in silicone, but, but yeah. Uh, and, okay, back to the minimum thermal conductivity. If I plot the thermal, con measure thermal conductivity just versus the average speed of sound, you can see, again, this very nice correlation between thermal conductivity and speed of sound. So that leaves out the sort of density in terms of predicting what's going on. But the lowest thermal conductivity is about polystyrene. Interesting. Polystyrene is what's used for, for doing thermal insulation already. Uh, you know, can we do better? It's maybe going to be very hard. Um, you know, but you can go up to quite high thermal conductivities, um, you know, for an amorphous material by making models stronger. Now these maybe not, are not very practical. They're, not, they're kind of brittle. But if you have uh, some thermal man, you know, might be useful in thermal management. So the way possibly to go below this, say, polystyrene or to go below, you know, this kind of lower limit for the thermal conductivity of these polymeric materials, it turns out that these things called fullerene derivatives do go well below that. And it was first recorded in 2013 uh, by the University of Virginia group. We were not able to reproduce that low number. We found that everything we did was really in this range of 0.05 to 0.06, kind of a coincidence similar to the tungsten diselenide. These are what they are. So if I take a C60 fullerene and add this organic ligand on it, this particular one is called PCBM. This one is called PCB and B. These were developed. These are developed for organic photovoltaics, and this is this is really added to make the fullerene soluble in other polymers as an electron donor, I think, is, is the mechanism. So there are they're, they're materials that you can do. And we can measure their properties. We make thin films. I won't talk about it too much here or maybe even tomorrow. But if we run our equipment in the right ways with the right thicknesses and the right frequency ranges, we can separate thermal conductivity and heat capacities. Each of these circles is an uncertainty contour for the measurement. So the best fit to the data is in the middle. So for instance, PMA, PMA has a thermal conductivity of 0.2 and a heat capacity of about 1.8. This is just like a two-dimensional error bar if you want. C60 is about 0.1. But if I make these fullerene derivatives, which at some level you can think of as a composite of C60 and a polymer, it's really just a, C, it's just a fullerene molecule with a little organic thing added to it. Its thermal conductivity is not an effective medium between those two numbers. It's way down here. So what's going on in that material? Well, that's, I would say, is still unknown. There are some, some indications that many of the vibrational modes are somewhat localized in these, in these materials, you know, because of this extra ligand which separates the C60 molecules that's what's leading to lower thermal conductivity. But it's not really because the heat capacity per unit volume is small. The heat capacity per unit volume is not really all that different. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, well, this is measured in our thin, these are thin layers. Uh, no, this, this, these, are, these are uncertainties from the noise measurement. I mean, the, the plus are, these are 95% error bars, so they're a little bigger than the typical error bar. Um, it's probably not as bad as it looks. Um, you know, and this is how we, when we do our measurements, uh, the sensitivity to the heat, it's, it's a little harder to separate out the heat. It's partly because these things are coupled somewhat. 
and it's a little hard to separate it out. We're mostly interested in the thermal conductivity in this experiment, and in some sense, we don't care as much about this, but just that the indication is that they're not a sort of anomalously small or anything like that. Um, yeah, but you're yeah, right. You know, how, how can you, you could, could we do better? Maybe we could do better, but I think this is just sort of a, the, you, this, the sensitivities are not great to the heat capacity. And these are, you know, these are 50, we're measuring the heat capacity of a 50 nanometer film. There's no, you're not going to do that by convention. So let me just summarize this idea of ultra low thermal conductivity. So we're working to extend and lower the limits of thermal conductivity, both in these sort of layered materials as well as the molecular materials. Both of these classes of materials, turbostratic two-dimensional materials and fullerene derivatives have thermal conductivities about twice of air, lowest that we know of but the physics is really completely different in these two, two materials. And, but where should we keep looking? Where, where, where would we find molecular materials with even lower thermal conductivity? Um, you know, where would we find, or, or in these kind of turbostratic structures? Okay, let me switch now to high thermal conductivity. Um, this is um, kind of motivated, driven, by really impressive advances in the ability of the theorists to calculate thermal conductivity. And this is something that's been developed over probably more than a decade, probably 15 years almost now from the sort of first indications of this kind of approach. But essentially what's being done is you're doing say density functional theory on a crystal, calculating all the third harm, you know, all the, of course, all the second order elastic constants, in other words, the phonon dispersions, but also all the anharmonic three phonon interactions. So that seems like a big computational task, but okay, we have a lot of big computers now, you can do all this. And then you take that input and you solve the, what's the pyrroles boltzmann equation. So uh, maybe um, Humphrey Maris talked about that last week, the equations that describe thermal conductivity due to phonons. And this can be taken into account fully the, you know, the difference between you know, phonon drifts, you know, so normal processes versus Umklopf processes and the whole thing, it can be iteratively solved. And it's a very rigorous solution of the equations. And it can comes from first principles. And it's, it's actually quite reliable for simple crystals. And this is one of the most exciting predictions from this new capability was to you know, go through lots of materials and find where something surprising happens. And what David Broido and his co colleagues did is discovered that this zinc blend crystal, boron arsenide, had predicted to have a thermal conductivity above room temperature, or at room temperature about the same as diamond, and above room temperature higher than diamond. So that was exciting from a thermal management viewpoint. And why, it seems very strange think like why, you know, you, this is actually a nice comparison. If I take the average, you know, in some sense an average of boron and arsenide, bo arsenic masses in a zinc blend crystal, okay, like this, <laughs> then silicon is in between them along the diagonal. <laughs> and so if I think of just cubic, why, why is boron arsenide very different than silicon? Well, they have actually very similar velocities. So the red is the silicon phonon dispersion. The black is the boron arsenide dispersion. The silicon acoustic modes start out about the same. There's some differences at, in how much they disperse. And then the other big difference is the boron arsenide acoustic or optical mode, because the boron atom is very light mass, is shifted way up. And one of the cr very critical points is, is that this gap between the acoustic and optical phonons is tw more than twice, approximately twice, but a little bit more than twice the, the entire acoustic phonon bandwidth. So in other words, there's no way to combine two uh, optical phonon or acoustic phonons to make an optical phonon. And that's kind of a key idea here, that if you can get the acoustic phone or the optical phonons kind of out of the picture, that the thermal conductivity increases. 
That's just part of it. It also turns out that the dispersion is critical too, though that's harder to understand in a kind of hand wavy way. So thermal conductivity of boron arsenide, we measured it. So there's actually a big group of people in, in the U.S. who are studying this under funding from the MURI programs. Um, and so groups were growing crystals and we were doing measurements on crystals. And this is our measurement from my group of a couple different crystals of boron arsenide. This is one example of a boron arsenide crystal. They're, they're small, a couple hundred microns across. Those were, at the time, those were big. We started out with much smaller. Now we can get millimeter or the growers can get millimeters, but they take you know weeks to a month to grow millimeter crystals. And we get a thermal conductivity at room temperature of about 1,000 in a very steep temperature dependence. And it turns out this is the, three the original prediction based on three phonon interactions. And it turns out this is just not sufficient. So it's a nice, nice um, story for scientific method as well in a way. So theorists predict amazing thermal conductivity in boron arsenide. Experimentalists say, well, wait a minute. It's not, it's high, it's not that high. Theorists say, oh yeah, well, we need to include or higher order processes. You can imagine how complicated this gets, and it's an enormously complicated calculation to include all the four phonon interactions, but now they can do this, a couple groups can do this, and when you, when you make that addition, you get a curve that looks like that. So quite, quite respectably close. So now we gotta maybe improve the crystals and see, well, maybe these are not perfect. Maybe we need, maybe we need better crystals. Anyway, so there's a little bit of a, a you know, back and forth between the theorists and the growers and measurers and to, to see where we are um, with this measurement. All right. <laughs> Those are different crystals. Yeah, so I mean, we, I didn't include other ones. I mean, we sometimes we get way down here. So uh, that's a been a frustrating thing, I think, for everybody involved in these projects is that to grow these crystals, and they're even within the same growth, you pull out different crystals and they're different. And they have different carrier densities. The Raman scattering has shows different, like Fano resonances. The luminescence is different. So, you know, they're not very consistent. We don't know what the impurities are that are causing the problems. So we're not, yeah, we're still working on that. We need to do, you know, SIMS and other, I think we need to do a lot of other things. So right now we've just been, this particular, this paper in science where this is my group, um, we reported data for uh, Raman data and thermal conductivity data, I think for 30 crystals. And they're kind of correlated. But, but, you know, we, we, we had to screen through many, many crystals in order to find ones that are higher. So this is somewhat selective. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so this red curve is the same as this black curve. Sorry, I switched the... <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so this is the current theoretical prediction, so adding the higher order processes. The three phonon calculations are pretty general now. You c I think there are even things online you can get the codes and do this for your favorite crystal um, up to some level of complexity. I'm not sure if it can handle, I think it gets, it runs into trouble of things like bismuth telluride is already too complicated. But but for this for four phonon scattering right now the code that's codes that are available I believe are limited to cubic crystals with two atoms. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yes, that's a three phonon model too. And it turns out in diamond um, three phonons are sufficient. And that's again probably because the optical phonons are not, there's not this big gap. It's, it's similar to silicon. There's no, there's no real gap in the optical phonons versus the acoustic phonons. Um, it turns out gallium nitride is somewhere in between. We published a paper about gallium nitride. 
At room temperature, three phonons is sort of enough, but if you go to higher temperature, you need four phonons. And that's, you know, again, maybe just the details. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is a uh, – well, but, but if they, they can decay, then they can also upconvert, so they can interact, so it limits the acoustic phonon mean-free path because they can transform up. Yeah, you know, bond – right. Yeah, right. I think, you know, as people have been become more sophisticated about the calculations, it's become more – I think more uh, – understood that the optical phonons play a lot of roles in the phonon scattering of the, of the acoustic phonons. So, um, to maybe to an extent that wasn't an issue before. Okay, I wanted to actually, Clemens, we, Clemens' name was mentioned. I'm gonna do a kind of Clemens-like model. Um, so Paul Clemens was a, one of the kind of early thinkers, I guess, about phonon transport. Uh, he passed away recently, a couple years ago. Um, and, um, so here's a very simple equation to describe thermal conductivity of a crystal. This is just, you know, if I just consider all the processes as resistive, I don't have to worry about normal scattering. I can just add up the, the modes, the heat capacity, the group velocities, the relaxation times of the modes, and this just gives me the thermal conductivity of the crystal. Okay, so it's very kind of simplest kinds of kind of picture I could do really uh, to get thermal conductivity. So now we, then we do something, okay? Let's assume that it's a Debye-like model. So I just assume a linear dispersion. The frequency um, of the modes is just, you know, the, there's a linear dispersion, just a constant velocity. And again, this is too, just very crude, but just I want to make a point. And that the relaxation times go is omega squared times T. This is, a, again, a very early assumption that turns out to be not so bad. But it's basically essentially talking uh, based on uh, density of states kinds of arguments that the uh, uh, relaxation times would go as a squared time t. All right. Well, if you do all that and you just have a parameter here to describe the, the um, dispersions, it turns out that the density of states, which is goes like omega squared, and the relaxation time, which then goes like inverse omega squared, cancel out. So you just really have a constant times the integral of the frequencies. And so the thermal conductivity looks like that. So now if I convert that integral over an integral of mean-free path rather than an integral of frequency, and that's a, a way of thinking about the problem differently. So thinking about how different mean-free paths contribute to the thermal conductivity rather than different frequencies contribute <laughs> to the thermal conductivity. Um, I can make a change of variables. So I do a change of variable from frequency to mean free path. Then I get this equation. And doing this, you know, integrating out to some length, to some maximum length, gives thermal conductivity is 1 minus the square root of the ratio of this mean free path at the cutoff frequency divided by the maximum mean free path that contributes to the thermal conductivity. So uh, maybe that's a lot of equation, but let me just draw, draw it for you. So very simply, it says that if I want to talk about how the thermal conductivity varies as, or accumulates, we say, as a function of mean free path. So this is the, um, you know, the maximum that I'm going to consider. If I make that maximum go out to infinity, then I approach 1. But you can see how broad this distribution is. This is a log scale. And so I go from, say, 20% to 80% over a factor of, I don't know, 10 to 30 in mean free path, or often we talk about 10% to 90%, two orders of magnitude. So in order to talk about the thermal conductivity within this sort of simple crystal model, I have to consider mean free paths that span two orders of magnitude. And this is what this kind of like thinking does. And this isn't too far off of what a real crystal behaves but it gives you an idea. Well, this is a very, you know, you know, kind of a big deal in the field because if I start talking about, you know, the thermal conductivity coming from this broad distribution of mean free paths, 
if my heat sources and boundaries or other things are at the nanoscale, then I have to worry about what happens to the thermal connectivity in a kind of complicated way because there's this big distribution. And so that's what I'm going to jump into here. So I'm not going to talk about TDTR so much today. I'll talk about it more tomorrow. But it's a, you know, it's a method that we use to do the thermal connectivity measurements. And we want to know when does Fourier's law work? When does heat diffusion oh, sufficient? You know, we analyze the data in terms of heat diffusion. When is that a sufficient description? Well, it goes on the details. But let's see if we can quantify how the Fourier's law breaks down and if we can use the information about the breakdown of the diffusion equation to learn something about that distribution of mean heat has in the materials that we're interested in. All right. But it turns out, OK, this is a tough problem, particularly because the sample has an interface involved, which is adding to the physics in a, in a complicated way. But this is the basic idea of, of the experiment. So we have a laser which is heating a region on the surface. It's a width, 1 over e squared width. We write it w naught. If we kind of plot what the heat fields look like in the crystal at some particular frequency, it turns out the frequency scale is really the important property. We can talk about things like the diffusion of the, the penetration depth of the heat, which is the diffusivity divided by pi times the frequency. That tells us how far the heat is, is flowing. This is, I think, calibrated for our experiment on silicon in our, our, our kinds of experiments. So you can see the heat is diffusing over kind of micron link scales for laser spots that are also kind of micron link scales. That's the kind of experimental regime we can do. And we want to know if we can use Fourier's law. Can we use the heat diffusion equation to analyze our experiment or not? And if not, what can we use that? information to do. And that's, the, that's kind of the subject, right? Um, so we have seen that it fails, okay? Certainly my group has seen this, you know, quite a long time ago in semiconductor alloys. Actually, the failure is pretty dramatic there. You can't, the diffusion equation doesn't work so well. If you have a, say, a silicon germanium alloy or indium gallium arsenide alloy, things like that. And I'll say a little bit more about why. And then this is Gong Chen's group. Austin's a professor now at Caltech, where he showed you know, that the diffusion equation failed as a function of spot size, so how big I make the spot, but he, you know, at low temperature. Uh -huh. This is maybe 10 megahertz. That's a typical frequency. We were typically working in 1 to 10 megahertz range. Okay, so, all right. Well, the first thing you see if you go, you know, if we dig in a little more detail, this is now just a silicon crystal, is that the apparent, we use the word apparent thermal conductivity. That's a, that's a big fudge factor there. Apparent thermal conductivity means the thermal conductivity that I get out of the data if I assume the diffusion equation is correct. Right, that's the apparent thermal conductivity. Um, it turns out that the apparent thermal conductivity of silicon is anisotropic. So it's different in different directions. But it's a cubic crystal. Thermal conductivity is a tensor. Thermal conductivity is a second rank tensor. In a cubic crystal, though, it be reduces to a scalar again. And the cubic crystals are isotropic for thermal conductivity. So what's going on there, and this is maybe, again, a little, a little bit of detail. These are like in-phase, out-of-phase signals. In-phase signals doesn't see it. The out-of-phase signal, which is this 10 megahertz response, does see it. And that's essentially because of this, what effective, or this apparent anisotropy. And the apparent anisotropy is not small. So this is a, for a, quite a small spot size, one micron radius. The apparent thermal conductivity is 140 watt per meter Kelvin normal to the surface. That's the same as the bulk crystal. But it's only a 100 watt per meter Kelvin lateral direction in the crystal in this, this analysis. Okay, So that's part of this, this breakdown of the diffusion equation. We can do a little bit more. That was just the heating of a spot. We can do a little bit more precise 
questioning of this breakdown by moving the p measurement of the temperature relative to the source of heat. We call that beam offset TDTR. And we can analyze that again in terms of the diffusion equation. So we offset the probe relative to the pump on this aluminum coated silicon sample. And we see a little bit larger anisotropy, a little bit, you know, 80 versus 100 in the previous. And this is just the fitting. So if you fit the data to an isotropic model, it would be the blue line. If the bulk crystal would look like this, the anisotropic model would go like that. So you can fit the diffusion equation really accurately. That's a pretty, pretty accurate fit. But you've given yourself another parameter and, and said that the thermal conductivity is different. Mm -hmm. You had a question? Yeah. Yeah. I can see the question in your eyes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, the measurement is the measurement. You get a, you know, you put in heat, you measure the temperature. And there's no breakdown in that. <laughs> but we have to, but the breakdown comes in is that, you know, if we analyze the temperature, we have to use a model. And we normally use a diffusion equation model. And that, uh, that is not, you know, that, that can't take into account these small link scale effects. So if you had a more sophisticated model, and actually Austin Minnick's group does, and then they, they don't have to sort of call it this, you know, a parent and they can get a little more information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the, the beam offset method is more sensitive to what's happening laterally in the sample than the single location. So we see this, you know, this kind of the fact that we the heat diffusion is different or propagation diffusion is different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, essentially. Um, yeah. So this is this attempts to sort of say that yeah, ballistic carriers are significant. Okay. It, you know, um, it's a little more complicated. The problem really we, we we face in all of these, and the other groups do too is that there's this aluminum silicon interface. And you don't, we don't know exactly what the physics is at that interface in terms of how diffuse it is or how reflective it is to phonons. And that affects how you might, conc what conclusions you might draw. But the, the basic sort of hand-waving ideas are if you think about the temperature field in the material laterally in the material, this is meant to be a sort of lateral radial direction, might look like this. And if I draw a slope on this radial temperature grade, you know, if I make a temperature gradient and I calculate a heat current, then I would overestimate the temperature differences. So if I have ballistic carriers that can kind of see temperature differences on longer scales, then they, they can see smaller temperature differences. So the phonons originate and scatter across longer link scales. They don't see the full gradient. While from the normal direction, if you assume, particularly if you assume that this interface is, you know, thermalizing, then the, in the normal direction, you basically always see a big temperature gradient. So the, the heat currents normal to the surface are more connected back to the properties. Okay, so we can push this a little bit harder. And I think this is something, you know, again, my group, maybe thinks about it a little differently because we think of it more of a materials problem. But let's say we have a phonon, we have this phonon mean free path distribution, phonon scattering in the material, and we want to change, we want to manipulate it so we can test our thinking. With silicon, um, we, so we did two things. One, we added boron, so we doped it. The boron has a different mass than the silicon atom, so it does create Rayleigh scattering, mass disorder scattering. But it turns out that's much weaker effect than the whole phonon scattering. So the holes that are created by the boron, by doping, the, by the acceptor, creates phony scattering of low frequency phonons due to the deformation potential scattering. Germanium, if I add germanium to the silicon crystal, that's a big mass. It's, it's 
but it's isoelectronic, so there's no carriers introduced. But big mass di disorder creates scattering of high-frequency phonons, <coughs> Rayleigh scattering, omega to the fourth. And if you look at this kind of thermal conductivity accumulation, now I'm writing it in terms of even a different variable. Now it's in terms of wave vector rather than frequency per nuclear path. Silicon looks kind of like this. If I add boron, I quench the low frequency phonons, the low, low wave vector phonons. If I add germanium, I quench the high frequency or high wave vector phonons. So now I have different distributions of phonons I can play around with and sort of ask, go back and ask the same questions. Or I can look at in terms of this accumulation versus mean through path, which I spent some time talking about. This is from first principles calculations. This is our simple, uh, simple model, which is the black line. These are other people's plots. So um, if I add boron, it doesn't affect the short mean free pass. It affects the long mean free pass, so it reduces the thermal conductivity. If I add germanium, it, this, it doesn't really affect the long mean free path phonons, but it affects the short mean free path phonons. And so you get these very distri different distributions. But the key point is if I add boron, this distribution gets narrower. So instead of having this accumulation go over this couple orders of magnitude, it kind of stops here. The accumulation only exists over, say, a factor of 20 or so. If I add germanium, it gets much broader. Orders of magnitude <coughs> distributions and mean free paths are contributing to the reproduction. So very, very broad. So then we can look and see what those changes in, the, in these um, distributions of the, of the phonon mean free paths have on these experiments. And this is a lot of data, and maybe the, the details are, um, you know, not, this is just regular aluminum on silicon. We get spot size dependence, just as Austin Minnick saw a long time ago. Uh, if we add, the key really idea is if we add boron, a lot of these effects go away. So these are different spot sizes. These are different frequencies down here. And if you add the boron, make the distribution of phonons narrower, it becomes more like the diffusion equation, and a lot of these effects go away. <laughs> if, the, if we make the distribution broader, then the effects become much stronger. And you get all kinds of breakdowns in the diffusion equation solutions. Okay, so let me just finish this idea. I don't have a lot of time. I just got a, a couple, maybe one other idea. So the failure of the Fourier's law in these sort of small tra link scale transport problems, it's more significant in the radial direction. It's more significant when the diffusivity of the high frequency phonons is small. That's the germanium doping. And it's more significant failure when the accumulation function is broad. Silicon turns out to have a relatively broad distribution intrinsically. Then we ask the question, you know, do, can this breakdown give us information about the mean free path distribution in the material? Well, again, there's lots of calculations, lots of theory that has to go into that. But just qualitatively from the data, the answer is, well, yes, you can if the distribution is sufficiently broad so that those breakdowns in the diffusion equation solutions are significant enough. If the distribution of the phonon mean free paths is narrow, such as when we add the boron, then those breakdowns are quite small, and you really just don't have any sensitivity. So in other words, you can probe very broad distributions, but you can't probe narrow distributions. All right. Um, that's, that's basically just the same thing. There's also thermal grading experiments if you want to dig a little deeper into this. The MIT group has done this, also now Austin at Caltech. And those experiments have the advantage of not having the transducer in them. They're more limited in some sense because they can only apply to materials that are just the right combination of absorption and transparency. It's because you need to be able to heat the material as well as be able to probe it. And so it works wonderfully for, or you got to pick the wavelengths right. So silicon works really well, uh, but it hasn't been applied to many other things. Uh, let's see, we've got about 10 minutes. I think I can talk about one other thing and I'll have to put the other thing.
things aside. Um, so this is, comes back to this question again, you know, the bigger picture question is, maybe we know a lot about phonons and crystals, we know a lot about electrons and crystals. What are the limits that set how much the magnons of a crystal can carry in them? And it's a question that's, you know, been interesting to me and others. Uh, what are the upper limits of that? So here's some different cuprates, copper oxide compounds. It turns out that the spin coupling in a copper oxide compound, copper to oxygen to copper atom, is extraordinarily strong, almost uniquely strong, I think. It's a you know, very strong um, exchange interaction from copper, oxygen, and copper. And those very strong interactions produce you know, high ordering temperatures. They produce um, very strongly dispersing magnons as well. So maybe that's the place to look. And this is from Christian Hess, 2007. This may be his PhD work. I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, calcium copper oxide measured thermal conductivity parallel to chains of spins, chains of copper oxygen, copper atoms. This is what was called a two-leg two ladder where the spins are um, arranged in a, a w they're, they're strongly coupled along the ladder, but weakly coupled across the ladder. And then two-dimensional spins, such as in lanthanum two copper oxide, there are planes of antithermagnetically ordered spins in the material which can carry heat. And look at the numbers. So this is presumably, these are the kind of phonon only. This is phonons plus magnons. And you get thermal conductivities on the order of 20 watt per meter Kelvin. This, re this at lower temperatures is almost 100 watt per meter Kelvin. So this is a magnon thermal conductivity that's creating you know, heat conduction similar to what you might find in a you know, good crystal from the phonons. And this, e this again is say maybe 20 or 30. We are also very you know, intrigued by this kind of sharp peak and want to understand things and studied the magnon and phonon interactions I'll show you in a minute. So the magnon, we're studying the magnon phone. So one thing you can do is, is also improve these material or sort of simplify the physics by dope ma making mixtures here and that essentially takes some of the carriers out of it. So it becomes closer to an insulator so that there aren't electrons. That's the, that's the main point. And this is this kind of complicated crystal structure. This doesn't even represent really the full complexity very completely. It turns out some of these things are actually internally incommensurate with each other. So the crystal is intrinsically incommensurate. It has, it has structures in it that don't align with other structures in, in, in terms of these, these layered materials. And so we're interested in these, uh, you know, these um, copper ladders or whatever. Oh, no, sorry. This is the ladders. The ladders are here. These are the chains. So there's different kinds of them. So spin waves are carrying the heat, let's say, are, are part of the mechanisms that are carrying heat in the material. So if you talk about a lot about phonons here, but maybe spin waves have, haven't discussed a great deal. This is just a cartoon. So if I have a ferromagnetic ground state, you might think of all the spins aligned. If I want to think about a excitation, a thermal excitation of that ferromagnetic ordered spin chains, you might think about spins that are precessing, you know, in a kind of a and have a wavelength associated with them and some excitation. But you know, I find it all okay. I'm not really an expert in these things, but spin is kind of inherently quantum mechanical. Atom motions in a crystal are mostly classical. So I can, think, I can think about phonons as being displacements and all that. I think spin waves, you can't really talk about this this way. Um, the equations come out the same, but there's a very, I mean, it's very dangerous maybe to think about sort of classical models of processing tops and things like that. It works. I mean, the equations work. The equations work out in the end. Uh, one way I think about it is if I have a flip, if I think about w flipping one of these, and then distributing it across a, a wide range of wa wavelengths, then you can kind of maybe think about that. 
Uh, you know, and dispersions can be studied by neutron scattering, just the way dispersions can be studied by neutron scattering of phonons. This is an example. I don't know how in the world they got that curve from this blob, but neutron scattering people can do amazing things. Um, but this is th this is the dispersion <laughs> of this particular um, spin ladder system. And note the energy scales. These energy scales are large, hundreds of milli electron volts, you know, over fairly small wave vector ranges. And so these velocities are really very large. So the, you know, the, the equivalent of the root velocities are, are quite big. And that produces, you know, presumably produces this very high thermal connectivity. So uh, what we did with using TDTR is we could also study how this magnon heat conduction varies with the frequency of the heat waves that are propagating in the material. At high temperature, we really don't see much. This is up to 500 Kelvin. If we go to lower frequencies, we see these separate so that the higher frequency heat waves don't see the full magnon heat, condu heat conduction. And this is, you can think of this as really because we have to put heat into the phonons and then the phonons have to transfer their heat into the magnons. And if I do that at very high frequency, then the link scales involved are short and it just can't completely couple. And this is comparison to the steady state measurements on simple materials. I just kind of back up for a second before I dive into some more details. This very strong peak in the thermal connectivity is, like I mentioned, is also very intriguing to us when we think about materials that we look for materials physics that has other thermal function. This is unfortunately at low temperature, but if we had a material like this that had this kind of peak thermal connectivity at some elevated temperature, and it was you know quite a large thing, you can imagine it might be very useful as a kind of thermal regulating system in some way that has a lower thermal connectivity at low temperatures. As I heat up the crystal, the thermal connectivity turns on you know, could keep something stable. So that was one of the original reasons we were um, studying this. Uh, this actually turns out, to yeah, go ahead. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's actually, it's an interesting point. Um, I mean, normally you might think that you might get a peak at something like four times some critical, like two level system energy or something like that. That's where the, um, and that's about what you see. So. This is about, yeah, maybe that's not quite right. I mean, essentially you're down, you, you have, um, there's a gap. So that's a critical thing. So the magnon, I didn't mention that before. The really critical thing is, is that there's a gap in the dispersion. So phonons go to zero frequency. So they're always there. The magnons in this particular system have a, have, have a gap at low energy. They don't go to zero frequency. And so I have to have a finite temperature to excite any of them. And that it all works out that this corresponds to essentially the, therm the turning on the ex thermal excitation of the magnons. And then the question becomes is why does this go back down? And that was also interesting to us. We're not really, really sure, <laughs> um, you know, how to think about that. Yes, it has a negative velocity up here. I don't think we ever thermally excite anything up here. You know, this is, I mean, we never get beyond around here, right? Room, room temperature times four would be there. So. But not if they're th not thermally excited. There's no energy. There's no thermal energy. Pretty much any, you know, if I talk about heat transport, anything beyond four K Boltzmann T I can ignore. It doesn't, doesn't participate. <laughs> Four, something like four. Right. So I don't, ha I don't have to worry about anything out, out up there. Yeah. Um, okay, so I, I just, I should quit. Um, essentially, there's, if you do two temperature-like models, there are link scales involved. Those link scales are very small. Um, you're, they're at the nano scale. This is 100 nanometers. This is the link scale that's required to couple the magnons to the phonons, and we can probe that link scale by varying the length of the diffusion distance of the heat. That's the, those are the bottom line ideas. So if we make the heat diffuse farther, then we can couple better to the magnons. If the diffusion
used to be shorter than we can. And we can analyze all that data using a kind of two temperature model for the TDTR data. You get numbers like effective values for the magnon phonon coupling parameters, and they have a certain temperature dependence, uh, which looks like this. And we try to understand is this um, you know, described by magnon magnon interaction, magnon phonon interaction? What, what are the mechanisms that cause this thermal conductivity to go back down? In other words, what, what really limits? how high the magnon thermal conductivity can be. And we're still, you know, we're still asking those questions. I have a current PhD student who's studying lots of different cuprates out to very high temperatures to, to an attempt to kind of understand what that all means. And I should quit there. Okay. Coffee break, right? Okay. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> Yeah. No, that's yeah. What, no, that's okay. I didn't want to make delay people from their coffee break. That's a. <laughs> that's okay. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. None of these were metals. Yeah. No metals. No. 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 They're actually closely related to superconductors, of course. Uh, some of these things, like these these spin ladder materials were heavily investigated in the early days of high temperature superconductivity. I think some of these crystals like show up when you're trying to make one, two, three superconductors. And then there was a lot of work done on them. So think of anything? Well, okay, one, it has the highest group velocities for phonons. So the, the phonon velocities are higher than anything, uh, which, okay, if you think of thermal conductivity, I mean, I had that equation earlier, right? Um, and uh, this, okay, so just think of this equation. Actually, the heat capacity, so if I'm at room temperature, these group velocities are very high. These lifetimes are also very long. One of the reasons, I mean, that, that comes from a lot of different physics. One, one is that the anharmonicity is relatively weak. The covalent bonding, it's not very anharmonic. So the relaxation times are, are long for that reason. And also because the phonon, because it's coupled back to itself. So the, re, you know, so the fact that the group velocities are high also means that the phonon density of states is very small. And the phase space for phonon-phonon interactions is small. So the phonons don't interact with the other. There aren't many other phonon density of states for them to interact with. And those, are those kind of things combine to give a, a very high thermal conductivity. Um, qualitatively, early on, you can, you can make an argument that the thermal conductivity, a very simple, called the Leibniz-Schleiven equation. I can't remember, Schlom, I don't know, I can't remember the name, L, LS equation, says that the thermal conductivity should scale as the divide temperature Q. So there's a simple way of looking at things that says that the, um, thermal, the, the thermal conductivity of, of things should scale as divide temperature cubed. Diamond has the highest divide temperature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The assumption is, is that the ladders are the more important um, because the dispersion is stronger. That's, I think, the, the thinking. I'm not sure we know how to think about separating different contributions. Um, I mean, you can also even say, you know, how do we even know what we see is the magnons? You know, we don't, actually. I mean, all we can do is just say, you know, it, phonons never look like that. That's, that's almost the argument that it's different than what we expect for phonons in terms of the, the roommate temperature can't affect it with a magnetic field, for instance. So sometimes at low temperatures, you can affect magnon thermal conductivity by applying a big enough field that you open a gap. Yeah. And so you can do it due to the, just the Zeeman splitting. But here, we're talking about something where so th the gap's already very large. It would take you know, 100 Tesla to, to make a difference. No 
Okay, okay, good. All right. <laughs>